Good to have you with us on this Monday edition of Ed Schultz News and Commentary. I don't know about you, but I am completely entertained by the Sunday shows and the media angles trying to trip up Bernie Sanders. They simply cannot get him off his game. Okay, so Hillary Clinton leads in a national poll by some 30 points. So why is it this guy deep sixing? Why is he still competitive in Iowa and in New Hampshire? And who knows what's going to happen after those two showdowns? We're a long way from it being over with. But the narrative that is being thrown out by the media right now is that now uh, Bernie Sanders really never did support Barack Obama. Are you kidding me? They can't get him to take a shot at Hillary Clinton. They can't believe he doesn't take PAC money. They've tried the scenario that he can't win. This guy has had more stuff thrown at him as a fringe candidate than anybody. But none of it sticks. They can't get him off his game. So CNN sits down with Bernie Sanders and asks him, is the edge off your campaign? Let's go back six months and let's look at Bernie Sanders announcing his candidacy and being three, four percent in the polls. No money in his campaign, no volunteers, no political organization running against uh, a woman who is enormously well known. Uh, whose husband was president of the United States. What's happening? That would be Hillary Clinton. <laughs> oh, you, well, I don't want to say so, oh, okay. but if you say it, I'll agree. Oh, okay. Look, we started off six months ago. Be honest, Gloria. Right. What did the media consider Bernie Sanders a fringe candidate, right? Not a serious candidate. Be honest. That was the case. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying, well, you haven't quite won this thing yet. That tells me that we've made real progress in six months. Actually, Bernie Sanders has won a lot of victories in the last six months. He's turned, Hillary, Hillary, he's turned Hillary Clinton on two big key issues, and now she's eyeing on what she's going to do with the big banks on Wall Street, which would be the third issue. So when it boils down to it, who's rooting for Bernie? Not too many people in the Senate, and a lot of this has to do with the fact is that none of these senators want to turn on Hillary Clinton or the Clinton machine because they all know that a list is kept. But this is how Bernie views these endorsements coming out of the Senate. So Hillary Clinton has 31 endorsements from people in the Senate. Yes. And you don't have any. That's correct. What does that show? It tells you that one of us is a candidate of the establishment. One of us is involved in establishment politics and establishment economics. And it says that maybe the other candidate is prepared to take on the establishment. That would be you. That would be me. Yes, I think that's probably right. They can't trip up Bernie Sanders. That's the bottom line. He is too focused. He knows who he is. For more on this, let's turn to Larry Cohen, who is one of the top surrogates for the Sanders campaign, former president, Communication Workers of America. Larry, good to have you back with us. My pleasure. Thank you. How, how hard is it to keep the entire team focused when these false narratives are, are being thrown out, like Bernie Sanders did not support President Obama? What do you make of this? Well, it's what you said. I mean, I think there's a there's a real effort to try to uh, deflate uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign. And and uh, I don't think it's working. I think that uh, there's an understanding in the campaign and among supporters, among voters, that uh, this is uh, a campaign and an organization that's not going away. That's going to refocus on the key issues and uh, the issues that differentiate Bernie and Hillary Clinton. And I think that's what we're going to see in the debate Saturday night. And that's definitely what this campaign is doing. OK, speaking of the debate, what has to happen for Bernie Sanders to get the country's attention, to get that campaign to the next level? A lot of people were critical of his first uh, debate performance. I was not. I thought it, I thought he did a fine job for the first time being on a stage that big. This, of course, is pretty much in her wheelhouse. But what are your expectations? Debate number two. I think uh, Bernie will do his best to focus on the key differentiating issues. I mean, is the economy working for working class and middle class Americans? Uh, she definitely comes from the tendency to say, you know, it's more or less working, but we'll have to try harder. Uh, what he just said in, in the clip you played, I mean, he is the anti-establishment candidate. Are people satisfied or aren't they? And I think that's what this is really going to come down to. Well, he had a great crowd again in Las Vegas over the weekend. Here's what he had to say when the question came up about why people should be interested in this election. So I know you're going to go back and people are going to say, why did you go to this rally? With some guy that no one has ever heard of. Why were you here? And I want you to tell them, I want you to tell them. If anyone tells you, you know, politics is bull and you should not get involved. 
I want you, I want you to ask them why it is that the Koch brothers and other billionaires are spending 900 million bucks on this election. They think it's pretty important. And if they think it's pretty important, your friends should think it's pretty important. Now that pretty much sums up Bernie's campaign uh, in a nutshell. Do the American people get it? Do you sense that around the country? Uh, yeah, I think more and more people get it. Uh, today he's going to speak to the leading immigration reform groups uh, called FIRM, Fair Immigration Reform Movement, uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, that's actually what brought him there. Uh, I think the campaign among uh, Latinos is soaring, uh, not only in Nevada, but in Texas. Unbelievable. In Texas, said this weekend, two organizing meetings, no Bernie Sanders, organizers, 500 in Houston yesterday, 400 in Dallas on Saturday. People are pumped up and, and ready to work and organize and, and mobilize. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, this campaign is rising. And uh, next week uh, he goes to, you know, uh, he's supposed to be going to the Midwest. I don't think it's confirmed yet where, you know, you've been clamoring for him to go. And I think as we open up new states, uh, the momentum will only grow and those national poll numbers will close up. See, I think the next big bump for Bernie Sanders is going to be in Ohio and also in Michigan. When he gets into Correct. the rust belt, when he gets into the rust belt, with his message on trade, his message on the middle class, I think you're going to see a bump of the polls. I mean, there are key areas of this country that the campaign hasn't even worked yet, because it, it, it's it's a chicken and egg kind of a thing. It has to evolve, and I think it's been a brilliant strategy to this point. I think it'll be interesting when he goes to that part of the country, the middle of the country that is heavy on manufacturing, heavy on the service industry. Uh, and, of course, the union that you used to uh, head up, the Communication Workers of America, is very big in the state of Ohio. So it's, it's going to be going to be interesting. But I want to I want to from a strategic standpoint, it's easy for me to sit on the sidelines and say Bernie ought to do this. Bernie ought to do that. It would seem to me that the biggest issue that, of course, one of the things that you've really been involved in and I've spent a lot of time on talking about is a Trans-Pacific Partnership and trade. But is it the mission now, Larry, to kill the deal? And, there, and that power lies within the hands and the votes of the United States Senate and Congress, that this deal can be deep-sixed. And if Hillary Clinton is really against it, would it be a good campaign strategy for Bernie Sanders to challenge Hillary Clinton to talk to these 31 people that are endorsing her in the Senate and say, you know what, are you with me to be against the worst trade deal in the history of the country? Is there a card for Bernie to play there? Uh, there's definitely a card for him to play. He's been an active leader of the campaign, not just somebody who issues a policy statement. And had Hillary Clinton uh, during the fast track fight, which was a much easier fight, uh, given our rules to win, had she been active against fast track, which was a much easier ask, she refused to participate in the campaign against fast track. Those 31 senators, the 13 who voted for fast track are all in that group of 31. Yeah. We had to move one of them to stop the cloture vote. So it's absolutely the right strategy, and it's uphill. I mean, that's the other thing that people need to realize. This isn't a campaign on the merits to defeat TPP. It's on the structure of how this vote will now go because of the fast-track vote. So in the Senate, it would take a near miracle to stop it, uh, because instead of needing 60 votes to move ahead in the Senate, now it only needs 50 plus uh, the vice president, which they have, and there's 55 Republicans. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, this is their issue the business roundtable, this is their number one issue. Moving Republicans in the Senate, forget it. You know, maybe the two or three that are running for president because it's unpopular. So you're yeah. back to the House, and in the House, uh, Ryan is basically in the pocket of the business roundtable in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. This is not a Republican maverick. This is somebody who does whatever big business wants. And so this is an uphill fight. And are people going to be satisfied that Hillary Clinton said, well, I don't think it met the standards that I had proposed, which, of yeah. course, is not what she said. She said it was a gold standard agreement. But is she going to campaign like in San Diego, where Peters and Davis, the two members of Congress there, are both bad on uh, on TPP? Is she going to go to places like that and say, come on, Scott, uh, we need to turn around here uh, uh, and, and oppose a trade deal that's going to uh, destroy American jobs? You, you know, that is the big thing. I mean, uh, it, she's got enough political clout where she can help this fight. To say that she's against it's one thing. To work against it is a totally different ball game where Bernie Sanders has been all along. What was the Sanders camp reaction to the President Obama on Friday saying no to Keystone? 
It was uh, euphoric, frankly, because, again, Bernie has worked on this from the beginning. Uh, major environmentalists are part of the Bernie campaign. So, you know, killing Keystone, uh, you know, we were dancing. I mean, this is great. And, uh, again, appreciate your work in many years on that as well. But, uh, you know, for Bernie, climate change is one of the three big issues, along with uh, economic justice and economic inequality and democracy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually believes that those seven grandchildren of his uh, face uh, almost a doomsday scenario if we don't radically shift our energy policy. So we were quite ecstatic uh, that President Obama finally pulled the plug on Keystone. Larry Cohen with the Sanders campaign here on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. Thanks, Larry. We'll do it again. Keep up the great work. My pleasure. Thank you. You you bet, my friend. All right. I I remember uh, when I was doing the cable show and we went to Nebraska to tell the story about those landowners who fought for eminent domain, who stopped the Keystone XL project legally in its tracks, who made the people realize in this country that putting a pipeline over the Olagala Aquifer was about the worst thing we could do. It was not environmentally safe. Plus, it's the worst oil to ever come out of the ground, tar sands. And they were really concerned to the point of tears in their eyes and their voices shaking when I was in Nebraska a few years ago doing that story. And when it came out on Friday that the president had finally said no to Keystone and was not going to permit the process, Uh, I I thought about those folks in Nebraska. We'll talk to one when we come back. Jane Kleb, Bold Nebraska, joins us on Ed Schultz News and Commentary right after this. Hey, folks, you've heard me talk about BioGreen Clean. I'm going to show you right now on my airplane just how tough this is. I want you to keep in mind, chemical-free, 100% plant-derived, biodegradable. It is the safest cleaner that you can get, and it's the most effective. Go to our website, wegotahead.com, or go to biogreenclean.com, www.biogreenclean.com, and order today. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good-paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. It's time to continue our conversation about mechanical insulation. Mechanical insulation is for the piping systems in our nation's commercial and industrial facilities. Facility owners are burning up billions of dollars through the lack of mechanical insulation on these piping systems. Call the iSave team. Insulation saves America valuable energy, and this team of energy conservation specialists is shovel-ready to save you money. Visit iSaveTeam.org to have a specialist give your plant an energy audit. The Ed Schultz Internet Broadcast is brought to you by the Ring of Fire Radio Show. Listen to the Ring of Fire weekends on radio stations across the country. Get more information and the news of the day at ringoffireradio.com. Good to have you back with us on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. We're here every day at wegoted.com, rawstory.com, and, of course, ringoffireradio.com. And, of course, we update a lot of things on my Facebook page. We'd appreciate it if you follow us there and like us there. Got the news on Friday, as, ever, as the world did, that President Obama finally came out and said no to the Keystone XL pipeline. Here's his announcement. Several years ago, the State Department began a review process for the proposed construction of a pipeline that would carry Canadian crude oil through our heartland to ports in the Gulf of Mexico and out into the world market. Uh, this morning, Secretary Kerry informed me that after extensive public outreach, in consultation with other cabinet agencies, the State Department has decided that the Keystone XL pipeline would not serve the national interests of the United States. I agree with that decision. Here's the bottom line, folks. Activism works. Had those landowners in Nebraska not made this an issue and brought it to the national forefront, I don't think we would have ever heard those words from President Obama. But To give him the benefit of the doubt, he tied it to climate change. The pipeline would not make a meaningful long-term contribution to our economy. So if Congress is 
serious about uh, wanting to create jobs, this was not the way to do it. So if that's the uh, case, why did it take so long for the president to get to this point? Was there constant political calculation? There was tremendous corporate pressure. The Republicans can't get enough oil going over the Olagala Aquifer, but activism works. And in the middle of the fight for years has been Jane Kleb of Bold, Nebraska. She joins us now on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. A big congratulations in order. Jane, thank you for joining us. Ah, thanks, Ed. You know, we couldn't have also done it without you at a moment where there was like this pause and this lull in the campaign. No national media on TV was paying attention to us, but you did. And so we also want to thank you today. Well, when I started looking into it, I was I thought the pipeline was OK. I thought that uh, pipelines were safer. But uh, then when you go to Nebraska, as we did at the time and uh, found out exactly the risk of that pipeline over the aquifer and God forbid if there was an accident, what it would mean in the long haul and how they couldn't clean it up and what this oil actually was and who was going to benefit from it. And uh, it was completely unnecessary on the world market. We're seeing that right now with the glut of oil and also the, how it plays into the climate change uh, message to the rest of the world. So, and, and I haven't even mentioned eminent do domain yet, property rights. And so uh, I turned on it. I turned on it for factual reasons. And uh, I would think that the State Department did the same thing. The bottom line now is, is that it's going to be kicked beyond 2016 into the next presidency. What does this ruling mean, Jane, at this point? Well, it does mean that Keystone XL right now today is dead. That if TransCanada wanted to try to build a pipeline in Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska, they would not be able to legally do that. So that's obviously very good news for landowners and tribal nations. Now, I mean, of course, TransCanada tomorrow or next year could reapply, but their permit on Keystone XL has been rejected twice now. Oil prices are so low that tar sands just does not make sense. I mean, not only Keystone got rejected, but 16 projects up in the Alberta tar sands region over the last several years have been canceled and shelved because of public opposition and low oil prices. It's that combination. So I certainly think that Keystone will continue to be like when you want to know where a candidate stands on climate action, you'll say, do you approve or not approve of Keystone XL? And you will know where that candidate stands. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, and I don't buy into any of TransCanada's talking points that they're going to magically, you know, get a permit next year. Do you think the Canadian election had anything to do with this, the electing of a liberal primaire, or a premier? I do. I mean, I think that there were so many factors that led to President Obama doing the right thing and rejecting Keystone. You know, Prime Minister Harper, who essentially told the president, I won't take no for an answer, which was the most arrogant thing I've ever heard a world leader tell another world leader. Um, you know, that certainly his defeat and his historic defeat, because it was a big defeat, um, definitely helped shape the narrative. Uh, Alberta, the home of tar sands, got a very liberal, essentially a Bernie Sanders-like uh, leader, which nobody thought would ever happen in that region. And she's uh, coming out, and I think she's actually getting ready to make some very broad announcements about the direction of tar sands uh, in their country. And so there were all these factors that came together, um, but it would have never happened, as you said, Ed, without farmers and ranchers, because they were this linchpin of the first delay, which the environmental community needed in order to get their facts to the president. You know, uh, that energy barn that you folks built down there, there had to be a party in that thing on Friday night, was there? <laughs> <laughs> we definitely, yes, we definitely went by there on our way to Lincoln. Uh, we had a couple beers with some farmers and ranchers and some <laughs> climate activists. Um, and we've had several emails, actually, from people saying, is it okay if I go to the barn? Can I take pictures? And everybody, you know, out there listening is always welcome to go to the energy barn and, and take pictures and see your name if you donated, uh, which is posted on the outside of the barn. How big a victory is this in the totality of climate change? Uh, I mean, this, this is something that uh, I think is somewhat of a benchmark moment that, that America is serious about fossil fuels. And I won't even uh, and, and that aside, I want you to answer that first, but there's one political angle that I think that also played into it. Your thoughts? You know, this is a critical moment because this now is, you know, nationally we would say a line in the sand. Obviously in Nebraska we would say a line in the sand hills um, where we have put 
essentially a marker saying we are serious about climate change. And we believe that each of these major infrastructure projects that lock us into energy of the past for 30 to 60 to 100 years is not going to be the direction of our country if we're serious about climate action and if we're serious about protecting property rights and if we're serious about protecting people's water supply. And, you know, President Obama mentioned all of those things. And the State Department in their, you know, final report talked about how also the tribal concerns were a big factor uh, in yes. their decision. So, you know, I think that, the, yes, I definitely think this is a marker. The, tr- the, the Native Americans were adamant about this. And uh, I, I visited the camp, as you did, about how they staked it out for months on end, about how they were going to fight to the death on this. That was the interview that I had on camera from a, a number of uh, Natives. In fact, when I went to Nebraska, there was a group of uh, Native Americans that drove six hours to meet our camera crew to tell their side of the story, which I thought was very profound. The political angle in all of this is that who would have profited? It's the Koch brothers. And that is something that really didn't get a whole lot of play by the corporate media, if any. But that is a fact, that the Koch brothers had major interests in all of this that would align their pockets and given them more resources to fight against progressive issues in this country. That's how I viewed it. No, that's absolutely right. They are one of the top leaseholders up in the tar sands region. Not only do they own land that tar sands is being mined out of, or used to be mined out of since it's kind of in a lull right now up in the Alberta region, um, but they also own a huge stake in the refineries. And they own a huge stake, the leading stake, in what's called pet coke, which is this essentially dirty form of coal. It's even dirtier than traditional American coal, uh, which China uses at very large rates. And so they would have profited. And anybody who thinks that they wouldn't have and that that's just a scare talking point from progressives and liberals, the people that were fighting us hardest in Nebraska were Coke-funded groups. It was Americans yeah. for Prosperity. It was this group called Nebraskans for Jobs, which was created, you know, by TransCanada and Coke-funded groups. And so, you know, they definitely would have made a ton of money. So it's a huge blow to the Koch brothers and Republicans. One of America's great activists, Jane Kleb. Congratulations. Bold Nebraska, keep going. It's been great to know you over the last few years and uh, seeing you do what you did. And uh, it's a bit, the country owes you a big thank you. Jane Club will do it again. I appreciate it. All the best. Thanks, brother. You bet. When we come back here on Ed Schultz News and Commentary, Ben Carson, the whiner, says that the media scrutiny is just not fair. That's next. Stay with us. We perpetuate a culture of crime all the way from Wall Street right down to the Main Street in our hometowns. It's worse than it has been since FDR took control of the problem and said we can't count on industry taking care of the American labor. They probably have already engaged in some type of criminal cover-up. And the law prohibits the government from even doing anything about it. Catch America's lawyer Mike Papantonio on YouTube at youtube.com slash TV. Schultz, Susan, commentary on this Monday edition. Well, we have got yet another full of shit moment by Ben Carson. Have you ever met anybody in your life that somebody is so smart that they're just kind of goofy? That they're the smartest kid in class and they come up with the wildest stuff? I think that's Ben Carson. Carson is trying to convince the American people that the vetting process that he's going through is completely unprecedented. That he is some kind of a threat to, quote, secular progressives. No, I've said all along, he is a gift. There is no way that Ben Carson can win the presidency because there are white rednecks in southern states that simply will not vote for a black man, especially in the Republican Party. So how does he think he's a threat? It's amazing. They would have to have unbelievable voter turnout across this country for Ben Carson to be president of the United States. It isn't going to happen. Or they would have to suppress the vote beyond anything we've ever seen before for him to be president of the United States. But this is Carson 
Carson on Friday complaining about the vetting process. There is a desperation on behalf of some to try to find a way to tarnish me because they have been looking through everything. They have been talking to everybody I've ever known, everybody I've ever seen. There's got to be a scandal. There's got to be some nurse he's having an affair with. There's got to be something. They are getting desperate. So next week, it'll be my kindergarten teacher who said I peed in my pants. Uh, you, you know, I've heard enough. Here, here's the bottom line, folks. The rocks go with the farm. This guy is polling high. He's right up there with Donald Trump. One week it's Carson, the other week it's Trump. What do you think there's going to be? Obviously, there's going to be a vetting process. Who is Ben Carson? Where did this guy come from? There's a curiosity about him, and he's viewing it as some kind of, you know, torpedo threat from the media, and they certainly don't want this guy around. It's outrageous. Now, you want to talk about vetting? Let's talk about uh, pallying around with terrorists, what Sarah Palin was saying about Barack Obama, in the Billy Ayers controversy, and the Reverend Wright controversy, and oh, by the way, the birther movement, which which really went into the 2012 campaign. And the very guy that's leading in the polls right now, Donald Trump, put a team together to go to Hawaii and find the birth certificate, which he never found. I don't think anybody is calling Ben Carson un-American, and I don't think there is any kind of movement out there on the left to make sure that we know that Ben Carson is not an American as what Barack Obama went up against from the right wingers. This is crazy. Have we forgotten the countless hours that Fox News spent trying to derail Barack Obama? Where's all these hours of programming against Ben Carson? I don't see it. There's a few questions here and there, but I don't see it. So he goes on to say this. Child. Vetting is a normal part of the process. Did you not expect this? I have always said that I, I expect to be vetted. But being vetted and what is going on with me, you said this 30 years ago, you said this 20 years ago, this didn't exist, this didn't exist. You know, I, I just, I have not seen that with anyone else. If you can show me where that's happened with someone else, I will take that statement back. I think almost every uh, person who has been president not, not like, would... No, not like this. I have never seen this before. And many other people who are politically experienced tell me they've never seen it before either. You don't many think other that, people. Uh, do you hear that? Many other people who are uh, politically experienced have told Ben Carson that no one's ever gone through this before. In fact, Hillary Clinton's never been through this. <laughs> this is laughable. By the way, Ben Carson... Can you give us the names of these politically experienced people that think you're getting screwed by the media? Give me a break. So Bernie Sanders puts it in perspective. He views it this way. I listened to the interviews with uh, Dr. Carson, and it's interesting. The American people want to know why the middle class of this country is disappearing, why we have 47 million people living in poverty, why we have massive income and wealth inequality, when you look at Dr. Carson, to the best of my knowledge, this man does not believe that climate change is caused by human activity. This man wants to abolish Medicare, impacting tens of millions of seniors. And this man wants to give huge tax breaks to the rich. I think it might be a better idea. I know it's a crazy idea, but maybe we focus on the issues impacting the American people and what candidates are saying rather than just spending so much time exploring their lives of 30 or 40 years ago. And Thank you, Bernie Sanders. And I would like to see Ben Carson sit down in front of some, quote, liberal media people and explain why we should get rid of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and why he is so screwed up on trade. That's the issue. But, of course, he'd probably be too sensitive about that because then we'd be accused of going after him. Ben Carson's a bigger joke than I thought he was. This is Ed Schultz News and Commentary, brought to you by Communication Workers of America, Alliance for American Manufacturing, BioGreen, Clean of the Eye Safe Team. We're back tomorrow.